Software Engineering Radio, Episode 60, Scrum. Welcome to another episode of the Software Engineering Radio. Today we talk um, about Scrum with Roman Pichler, which is another episode in our Software Processes and Methodology series. So, uh, Roman, could you please introduce yourself a bit? My name is um, Roman Pichler. I work as an independent Scrum consultant and Scrum trainer um, in the UK. And um, I'm currently helping a large American financial institution to institutionalize and embrace Scrum. Okay, so what's Scrum? Scrum is an agile framework focused on management practices, project management and requirements management practices. Okay, and um, where the, did it come from or who invented it? Scrum was um, invented by Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber in the early 1990s. Um, it is inspired by lean thinking. It is um, also inspired by the theory of constraints, uh, which is um, another management approach. Um, evolutionary processes, um, processes that evolve um, rather than being um, prescribed in a prescriptive way. Um, iterative incremental software development, certainly, um, which was um, popular, um, you know, throughout the 90s and um, engineering tools from um, the small talk engineering uh, community. And an important inspiration for, for Scrum was uh, an article published uh, in 1986 in the Harvard Business Review by uh, two Japanese uh, gentlemen called Takeuchi and Nonaka. And that article was called The New Product Development Game and investigated how Japanese companies um, managed to um, significantly reduce time to market of new product development efforts while at the same time um, increasing product quality and customer satisfaction. And um, as I said before, lean and lean thinking and Japanese approaches to product development um, are, are an important source and inspiration for Scrum. And actually Scrum and, and lean fit very, very nicely together. Yeah, interesting to see how all these um, methodologies base on the same roots. Um, so what are the basic ideas and principles behind Scrum? Well, I'd say um, a key idea, a key principle of Scrum is to have an empowered, autonomous, self-organizing team um, that delivers business value um, in, in, on a regular basis in a, in a, repeat, in a, in a reliable way, um, typically within every one to four weeks. And um, in a software development context, um, Scrum stipulates that um, the business value has to have the form of a potentially shippable product increment. So a piece of software that's tested and adequately documented and typically implements some some requirements um, has to sort of um, be available at the end of an uh, at the end of an iteration at the end of a sprint. Okay. okay. May I ask, what's a team in Scrum, um, well, Scrum talk? Uh, I mean, we talked already about extreme programming where team is pretty defined. Is the same true in Scrum? Well, in Scrum, a team is um, a fairly small and dedicated team. So a Scrum team typically has seven plus minus two team members. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be um, an empowered team that um, has uh, the authority to make decisions, has the right to select its own um, iteration goal guided by the product owner. And that's another role in Scrum. Um, so it's um, a small team, a dedicated team. It's empowered. Uh, it is self-organizing. Um, so a Scrum team um, should be able to organize its own work and the way people collaborate. And it, it also needs to be autonomous. It needs to be able to deliver work um, more or less independent of the rest of the organization and of other teams. And a Scrum team is also collectively responsible for um, delivering um, an iteration goal um, and, and making a commitment mm -hmm. um, and sticking to it, executing on that commitment. So a team is really the, the basis. Um, not When we later talk about Scrum of Scrums, um, uh, that's not the team anymore. It's we're really the basic team. 
Yeah, even large Scrum projects are made of um, multiple teams. So the way to scale Scrum is, or Scrum project is, rather than to increase the size of um, a team, um, new teams are added. Um, and those new teams also need to be dedicated, which means team members work typically full time on the team. Um, and, and have to sort of, um, have to follow the attributes, or, you know, exhibit the attributes we just discussed, um, in the same way as a single scrum team or some single scrum team project has to. Um, there's, there's another thing that's, uh, I'd, I'd like, I'd like to mention, and that is, um, scrum teams should be collocated, um, to facilitate close collaboration mm -hmm. and close communication of the team members. Okay. Um, so let's switch over to the practices I would suggest. What are the basic Scrum practices? What's Scrum? What's Scrum? Well, Scrum provides um, management practices, um, requirements management and project management practices. And the requirements management practices are pretty much focused around um, dealing with what we call in Scrum the product backlog, which is a list mm -hmm. of um, requirements, a, li a list of prioritized requirements, and the management practices are centered around release management, managing the entire project, uh, managing, creating a project plan, which we call the release plan in Scrum, um, estimating and tracking the project, um, but also managing sprints, and a sprint is simply um, the word for iteration in, in Scrum. Okay. Um, and managing sprints means planning sprints, um, estimating tasks, tracking tasks, um, daily stand-up meetings, which we call daily scrums in Scrum. Um, and uh, at the end of, an, of, an, of a sprint, we have a review and a retrospective in Scrum. Um, so Scrum is, is in a way um, very simple in, in the sense that it, it, it offers a small set of, of, of rules, you could say, or you know recommendations. And, and the idea behind um, having a small set of, of, of clear rules is that, you know, picking the right rules will, will generate meaningful and intelligent behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so that goes back to one of the sources of Scrum, um, evolutionary um, complex adaptive systems. Okay. So let's jump into the sprints thing. Um, as, as you said, sprints are the iterations in Scrum. Um, so they are the, the driving factor, I guess. Um, can you talk a bit about sprints? Yeah, sprints, uh, sprint in, in Scrum is, 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 is a mini project basically. So it is synonymous for, for iteration. Um, a sprint sh should have a, a, a goal. So it should be clear to all the stakeholders, um, what, um, the objective of the sprint is, um, what team and product owner are trying to achieve and get out of the sprint. Um, and a sprint typically starts, always starts with a sprint planning meeting. So the product owner, and the team get together. The product owner introduces the sprint goal to the team and the requirements um, that make up the sprint goal. Um, for instance, uh, you know, if, if, if this was um, the first sprint um, of um, the project, um, the product owner could choose something like um, um, tall trees have uh, strong roots, for instance, um, as, um, as, a, as a sprint goal. Um, and, and select adequate um, requirements that fulfill that goal. And then the team would go through the list of requirements, um, would discuss each requirement with the product owner, identify tasks, estimate the tasks, and then, you know, look at the team's availability, look at the team's knowledge and skills uh, distribution, and then say, okay, um, as a team, can we collectively commit to that requirement um, or can't we? And once all the requirements have been discussed, all the av availability, and, um, you know, the knowledge within the team's been consumed, the sprint planning is basically done. And then the team makes a final commitment and says, okay, this is what we're going for. This is a commitment. This is a promise. This is what we're going to deliver within the sprint. Um, and that's, that's the end of, of the sprint planning session. So rather than other agile approaches like extreme programming, um, sprint planning in Scrum is a commitment based or commitment driven planning approach approach where the entire team um, makes a collective commitment and, and promise mm -hmm. um, in, in order for that to 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 um, work um, scrum requires that sprints are protected from any changes so even though in scrum we do welcome a change and we embrace change um, what we say is for the duration of one to four weeks depending on the sprint length we basically freeze time and functionality requirements and also quality. I mean, in Scrum, we always want to deliver um, 
software with high quality, but we don't typically allow any changes um, once the, a sprint goal has been committed by the team. What happens if uh, the goals aren't reached in one sprint? What what happens with the these features or however they're called? What happens if um, a team can't deliver yeah. um, all the features mm -hmm. it, it promised and it committed? Uh, well, you know, basically from 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 uh, the teams and the product owners perspective um the sprint wasn't wasn't successful at least not entirely successful it sort of depends how um how many requirements the team didn't manage to to deliver and to a certain extent um, why that happened um, sometimes team members fall ill and, and that's difficult to 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 to, to um, accommodate for um, but essentially um the approach that's that scrum recommends is um to um put all those features, all, all those requirements that weren't delivered back into the product backlog. Mm -hmm. And therefore, those features have to be um, reworked or re re-delivered or worked on again in one of the subsequent sprints. So, so in Scrum, partially done work is never taken into account. Only work that's fully done um, and is accepted by the product owner at the end of the sprint. And only that work is um Is, is earned in a way, and you know, if you work with um, estimating techniques such as story points, only only part, only fully done work um, would earn a team story points, and would sort of then make up the team's velocity. So the planning for a sprint is um, well, it has to be reasonable. You have to plan some buffer in and holidays or what, whatever uh, comes in this four week iteration. Just the, the goals have to be reachable. Yes, the, the, the goals have to be realistic. Um, and it's, it's sort of, you know, um, Scrum ultimately is all about collaboration, mm -hmm. um, particularly between the product owner and the team. So it's up to the product owner to um, get a feel for the team's capacity and capability and formulate um, a realistic sprint goal and select, um, pre-select or shortlist um, an adequate, adequate user stories, adequate requirements. And it's up to the team to ensure that it, it knows its availability, it knows its its, its knowledge distribution mm. um, prior to the planning meeting. And, and typically, you know, that's something that, that, you know, the team and the product owner, at least, you know, a good product owner and a team that's used to the process will talk about prior to the planning meeting up front, you know, have a quick chat about, you know, the upcoming user stories um, so that the product owner gets some feedback and the team gets some visibility of what's coming, um, what's coming along. But because the whole thing is a commitment-driven planning approach, as you rightly said, it is important that the team is clear on what it's actually able to do because ultimately the team does um, does make a promise in Scrum mm -hmm. and it is bad practice to, to break a promise and it would undermine eventually the trust between the product owner and the team if the team, you know, um, did continue to to fail uh, meeting its, its commitments, its sprint commitments. Okay. Anything more to add on, on sprints? Oh yeah, um, <laughs> um, on, on a daily basis within the sprint, we have um, what's called a daily scrum, which is um, a meeting that uh, has two two objectives. It, it helps the team to synchronize and understand um, what everybody's up to, basically, um, and also typically, you know, reflect briefly on the project progress. And um, it also helps to identify in a systematic way any impediments, blockages, any issues. That help that prevent the team from being as productive as it could be, and, and escalate and highlight highlight those um, impediments. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the daily Scrum, and that's a short time boxed meeting. By the way, all meetings in Scrum are time boxed. Uh, the daily Scrum is typically 15 minutes. Um, it takes place at the same uh, same 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 location, same place, and same same um, uh, same time every day. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to a stand up in in, in extreme programming. Um, and that's um, a daily meeting. And, and at the end of the sprint, we have two more meetings, um, a review meeting and a retrospective meeting. And the review meeting is there um, so that the team can demo all the work results to the product owner. The product owner can inspect the software system that's uh, that's uh, evolved in this uh, sprint. Um, typically in, in, in form of, you know, seeing tests run, but also, you know, being having the, the opportunity to um, execute tests um, him or herself playing around with the software, having a browse through the documentation, making sure that all the conditions of satisfaction of um, the requirements, the user stories are actually fulfilled. Mm. Um, so that's the review meeting. 
and, and ultimately the review meeting determines how much progress the team made and if the team managed to meet its commitment or if the team under delivered or, or sometimes, you know, even, even over delivered. Mm -hmm. And then we have the retrospective, which is also a mandatory time boxed meeting in Scrum. And it's there for the, t for the team to understand um, how the team's been working together, how the team's applied the process and what the team could possibly do in order to um, improve the way um, the team members work together. Okay. The product owner, um, in which meetings is he? Is, is he in the daily scrum too? I typically recommend that the product owner does attend the daily scrum. Um, I think it's good practice to have a product owner that um, works closely with the team. Now, the product owner is really responsible for um, specifying the requirements, um, defining what's value added from a, from an end customer perspective is. So the product owner in a way is, is the voice of the customer, is um, a customer, end customer representative. Sometimes, you know, it may even be a good idea to ask um, an end user and end customer to take on the role of a product owner. Mm -hmm. um, in larger organizations, the product owner typically comes from marketing or product management, but should be in close contact with end, real end users and, and really understand the end user um, the end customer's needs and, and perspective. Um, and it is good practice that the product owner closely collaborates with the team throughout the sprints. Mm -hmm. That helps the product owner to understand the, the progress made by the team and, um, you know, helps to right size um, the, the, the upcoming user stories and requirements for the next sprint. Okay, so, so he doesn't have to know about software development processes at all. He, he just has to have um, domain knowledge? Well, the product owner certainly has to have domain knowledge, um, has to be able to look at um, the software from an end customer's and mm -hmm. user's perspective. I think the ideal product owner also knows about um, how software is actually developed. It doesn't necessarily mean that the product owner has, a, a, you know, um, What's deep, the software uh, deep, deep programming okay. skills, uh, but it, it would be good that, you know, the product owner has at least a rough idea how software is developed, okay. um, why it is necessary, for instance, to employ certain development practices or, you know, what good and what bad development practices are. Um, that just helps the product owner to make the right decisions. Scrum is, is quite interesting when, when, you, when you look at how the roles interact, that you have um, the team, which is quite a, quite a strong role, really one of the core roles as, as this autonomous self-organizing empowered um, entity. And then you have the product owner, which is, which is the second strong role in, in Scrum and, and the product owner guides and in, in a way also, you know, directs the team um, putting forward um, requirements that are consumed by the team and turned into working software. Mm. And helping, you know, having the knowledge, um, at least a, a rough understanding of, of how software development works will, will help the product owner sort of to, to um, make, make sure that the whole process is, is smooth and, and, and flows nicely. Yeah. But interesting to see that the product owner isn't part of the team, which is um, some other methodologies uh, see them as part of the team here. Yeah, I guess Scrum... You know, my answer would be, I'd leave that up to a certain extent to, to the team and the product owner and the organization, to mm -hmm. be honest. I think that the product owner should work closely with the team and product owners are typically classed as, as chickens in Scrum when it comes down to the daily Scrum. So they're allowed to talk at the daily Scrum. Okay. Um, could you, I, I'm not sure everybody knows this chicken pick thing. Um, could you explain it, please? We've got two types of animals in Scrum, uh, pigs and chicken. Pigs are those, uh, project members and stakeholders that are encouraged to talk at the daily scrum. Uh, chickens are uh, people that are stakeholders, um, more remote stakeholders that have an interest in the outcome of the project, but really don't contribute on a daily basis and haven't met any, any commitment in terms of the, the sprint goal. And those those uh, chickens are typically um, not, not encouraged or they're not even allowed to talk at the daily scrum. So product owners are typically classed as, as pigs when it comes down to the daily scrum and you know sometimes product owners take on tasks within the sprint such as um, performing acceptance uh, level testing but that sort of depends on the product owner and it also depends a little bit on the team independent of how independent of if the product owner takes on tasks related to the sprint goal i would recommend that the, that the product owner works with the team on a daily basis 
um, has time to answer questions of the team, has time to understand the, the progress, um, certainly attends to daily scrum, but you know, it's maybe also able to, to execute some acceptance uh, tests simply as I said, to, to be clear on, you know, how, how far has the team gotten to avoid any, any surprises at the end of um, the sprint. The projects, the Scrum projects and teams I've worked with, um, you know, those that had engaged product owners that worked closely with the team um, and had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time, um, you know, together with the team, um, you know, sort of being sort of, you know, partially co-located or at least, you know, taking, mm. taking along the laptop and working an hour, a couple of hours a day or so with the team, alongside the team. Those teams and projects did really well. Teams where the product owner was hardly available and, um, you know, just showed up for the, for the, for the sprint planning and then maybe occasionally for a daily scrum and, and uh, then, then for the sprint review session. Those teams, um, had more the tendency to, 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 to struggle and find, find it difficult, really. Even though the product owner it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, a proper f team member in Scrum. Uh, close collaboration is necessary. Okay. As we talk about, or we, we already finished the role product owner, so maybe we should continue with the other roles. Uh, you already mentioned the team. What's the team? The team is um, a small dedicated team in Scrum. So the, a Scrum team consists of seven plus minus two team members. Team members typically work full time on the on the project on on the Scrum team, and team members are typically co-located. Now, what's important about a Scrum team is that it needs to be an empowered team, um, and that means the team members have the right to um, make a commitment in the sprint planning meeting and you know commit to an iteration goal and, and select the user stories that the team feels it can actually realistically commit to. It needs to be autonomous. That means it needs to be able to deliver uh, the sprint commitments. Um, in independent in, in independence of other teams and projects it also needs to be self-organizing and uh, that means it needs to be able to organize itself and its work on a, on a daily basis uh, without needing anyone to um, direct the team um, you know and, and, and manage the team um, so that's 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 a that's a scrum team and typically a scrum team is also cross-functional which means it contains functions roles from different parts of um, the organization um, another way to look at this is to say everybody um, who needs to contribute to um, creating and delivering a software system um, should also be part of the Scrum team. So typically programmers and architects are part of the Scrum team, but also testers, also people that write the documentation, maybe a user interface designer. Um, sometimes it may even make sense to have somebody from marketing or a business analyst as part of a scrum team okay but how does this work i mean if i hear uh, i have a test uh, an architect and software developer and ui designer and documentation guy whatever uh, these were, were already five roles if i have teams just up to seven plus minus a few people the the teams are pretty small actually i can't do much in a scrum team no, in, in a way, that's a balancing act. Um, but, but typically, when you look at how many functions are involved in developing um, a piece of software, um, then, you know, there aren't that many more than I just listed. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it may make sense to um, form dedicated teams, for instance, you know, you could you could have um, sort of an exploration phase more investigation phase where you do um, where you investigate the user interface mm -hmm. design and you may do some some upfront UI design. Um, and then, you know, uh, limits the, the genuine new um, UI design, amount of, of new, new UI design that's done within the sprint. But, you know, that's sort of up to um, the specific project really to see how, how you can um, really optimize value creation. But, but typically the teams I've worked with um, consisted of, of um, as I said, you know, uh, programmers, architects, testers, mm. DBAs, somebody that's able to write uh, documentation particularly when you need end user and customer documentation and that's typically quite a quite a powerful um, scrum team okay okay so um last role i know of is the scrum master uh, you already mentioned you are one so what what's a scrum master what does what's his job in the project the scrum master well i'd say the scrum master is responsible for teaching the scrum process and being a role model, um, as they say, to, to walk the talk, basically. And that, 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 that implies challenging um, conventional habits and, and thinking. 
um, and at the same time to encourage um, new thinking and new ways of working uh, that are compliant with Agile and Scrum. So to a certain extent, the Scrum Master is a change agent, and that's um, typically the case when Scrum is first introduced in, in an organization. Um, the Scrum Master is also responsible for looking after the team health. Um, the Scrum Master helps the team to gel and become a performing team, a true team. And the Scrum Master also shields the team from external inter interferences. Um, we've already uh, discussed, uh, we've already mentioned that um, sprints are protected from any changes. Now it's the job of the Scrum Master, for instance, to make sure that that actually happens. Mm. And um, in that sense, act a little bit as, um, you know, uh, Ken Schwaber says, as a sheepdog um, and, you know, bark and sometimes maybe even bite if uh, any intruders come and try to do things like um, steal people off, off the Scrum team or, you know, um, change the sprint goal uh, midway through. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the Scrum Master also uh, tries to enable the product owner to drive um, and steer development directly by removing any barriers between the product owner and the team. Um, now, in conventional um, software development, we typically have a number of, of barriers between a product owner and, and the team. I mean, we have a project manager, we have typically analysts or architects, sometimes designers, um, and the idea in Scrum is that we say, well, we do we do away with all those barriers and all that sort of um, bloated hierarchy. Um, we have all the performers, all the right people on the team, so we've got a capable team, and then the product owner should be able to um, work directly with the team, and, and the Scrum Master is really there to facilitate that relationship. So the Scrum Master is not a project manager, certainly not in the traditional sense. Um, the, the Scrum Master is much more like, like a leader and a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And, and, and finally, um, the, the Scrum Master also has, has to help the organization to, to deal with any impediments and, and problems and, and issues that, that, that surface when Scrum is first applied. Um, things like um, the configuration management environment is not capable, um, not up to scratch and needs to be replaced. Um, a new server needs to be, needs to be um, in, in, in installed or maybe new memory needs to be bought. I mean, fairly trivial things like that that sometimes still, you know, have, have an impact in terms of, you know, raising some budget or um, bigger issues like uh, the product owner, the product owner's availability is too restricted. He or she needs to spend, be able to spend more time with the team to do a really good job. Um, those are things that Scrum Master has to has to sort of um, help to resolve and and if necessary escalate through the organization. And and being being a Scrum Master is sort of um, an awkward thing because um, if you're a good Scrum Master, you try to work yourself out of a job as as quickly as possible, which means that over time um, the team learns to be a self-organizing team. Um, the team has has learned to um, employ the process effectively. And the organization has learned to um, fully leverage Scrum and, and reap all of Scrum's benefits. And at that point in time, the Scrum Master role per se doesn't become redundant. But being a Scrum Master is no longer a full-time job. It's probably more a part-time job. And, you know, Scrum Masters can then move on and be also performers on the team. That's typically difficult right at the beginning when you first start, when you start your first Scrum team. Um, early on, um, Scrum being a Scrum Master typically means, you know, um, uh, the Scrum Master job is typically a, a full-time job early mm. on. I guess we are through with the roles, aren't we? Uh, any more roles? No. Yeah, those are, the, those are the three. You're absolutely right. Those are the three roles in Scrum. Uh, there aren't any more. Uh, all we have is product owner team and, and Scrum Master. And in a way, product owner and team make it tick, and the Scrum Master is mm. there to facilitate and lead and particularly you know, help with establishing Scrum, teaching the process. Um, those are all the roles we have in Scrum. Okay. Um, in the introduction uh, on the question, what is Scrum, you mentioned uh, the product backlog, which is um, a central point in Scrum to me. Um, can you give us a few th uh, words on this? The product backlog is a central requirements management tool in Scrum. It is a list of um, requirements and those requirements have to be prioritized. In Scrum, they're prior prioritized by value, benefit, by risk, and by cost. So the primary that dimensions for prioritization are, are really value and risk. And it's the job of the product owner to pull together an initial product backlog, stock it with requirements, and do a first prioritization. Um, the, the product backlog feeds the Scrum team. So in preparation for each sprint planning meeting, the product owner 
selects um, shortlists the high priority requirements from the product backlog and puts it forward to the team. And those requirements that are, have been that are, that are successfully transformed into um, potentially shippable product increments are then taken out of the product backlog. And as a product owner, if I want to add new requirements um, to the project I just added to the product backlog, I can amend requirements in the product backlog at any time. I can change the priority, um, but it typically doesn't have any impact um, on the team um, until the next sprint planning meeting takes place. Okay. The prioritization, how does it work? I mean, uh, in my experience, uh, we often end up with uh, priority lists where 90% of the features are priority A and everything else is B or C, which doesn't help so much. And it's even worse, I guess, if you have three uh, dimensions like business values, market, and technical risk. I mean, which, which is the order we, we work out the features afterwards? Yeah. I mean, ultimately in Scrum, it is really the job of the product owner to get the prioritization right. Um, that doesn't mean that the team doesn't, doesn't um, contribute and help. Um, in, in Scrum, we, we say that most of um, the features and functionality that are typically delivered by software systems are rarely or never used. That goes back to, um, I think, the, the chaos report of the Stanley's group in, I think, 2003 or so that showed that, you know, up to 60, mm -hmm. 65 percent of all features on software systems are typically rarely or never used. So one of the things we, we tell product owners is um, if you want to optimize value creation and if you want to um, cut out waste, then why don't you really focus on those features that help um, to make a difference for your end users and customers um, are critical to the task end users try to perform or, you know, are critical in order to sell um, a software product to end customers. Um, figuring out which of those features are the most important ones um, is, is then ultimately the job of the product owner. There, mm -hmm. there are a number of um, ways you can do it. Um, what, what, one of the tricks, um, or a, a good thing typically to do is to uh, group um, requirements by themes. Now, if you use user stories as your requirements description technique, then a theme is simply um, a cohesive set of user stories. Mm -hmm and you first prioritize the product backlog by themes um, before you try to prioritize on a, on a user story level. The reason for that is uh, that user stories tend to be very fine-grained requirements and often it's very difficult to associate a business value with a very fine-grained detailed requirement, even if that requirement still represents an end, end user or end customer's perspective. So in order to Prioritize from a from a from a from a um, financial or from a from a from a value and benefits perspective. Um, grouping by themes and prioritizing by themes is a good strategy. When it comes down to risk, it is certainly a good idea to talk um, to the team and see which technical risks the team perceives and um, which um, uh, requirements exhibit uh, a great deal of technical risks and should be addressed early on in the project to make sure that the team has the right approach to deal and handle with those to, to deal with those requirements and implement them um, adequately and, and successfully. Mm -hmm. How do technical features come in? I mean, something like uh, basic frameworks or uh, database access layers or stuff like this has to be done, or even a build machine has to be done by the team somewhere in the project. How does this um, be, how does it get into the requirement list? Or does it at all? I mean, maybe not. I, I typically recommend that um, anything the product owner ultimately has to pay for, um, should should um, make its way into the product backlog and should appear in the product backlog. So if the team has to set up its development environment and install um, a new build machine um, and configure that build machine, I would say that should be a line item in the product backlog. Mm -hmm. If you really want to go down to the to uh, the level of technical requirements and say, well, we should use a database access layer, you know. Um, That's a slightly different question. I would say generally no. I would I would keep the product backlog at um, I would I would keep the requirements in the product backlog um, at an end user and customer level, um, and not really go down to specific solutions. I think architecture models are a better way to um, capture design decisions and and make informed design decisions than the product backlog. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd really sort of separate the concerns, um, you know, design decisions, technical decisions, and, and end user requirements. 
that's that's my general recommendation. I mean, if you if you if you if you are in a situation where you have multiple teams um, feeding off the same product backlog, and those teams are um, organized along um, subsystem boundaries in our component mm -hmm. or architecture teams, then it could possibly make sense to split out end user requirements into more technical ones. But um, you know that be that be sort of a less preferred option from my perspective. I I, I very much. When it comes comes down to scaling up, um, Scrum uh, very much favors feature teams over component or architecture teams. And again, that, that allows you then to keep your product backlog nice and clean and tidy and mm. state requirements from an end user perspective and leave it up to the team to decide how they're going to get implemented. Okay, so, so it, it's okay for you if there are some sprints where uh, just very few uh, user requirements are actually implemented because parts of the team do these um, technical stuff um, and the product owner doesn't see it in his lists. Yes, that can happen. It can happen that the first um, one or two sprints um, don't create much um, in terms of business value. Um, I mean, the general requirements Scrum places on sprints is that every sprint must create a potentially shippable product increment and provide some business value. Now, that increment in the very first sprint could be very, very um, small. It could be, you know, very potentially shippable, but it would be a good idea to um, to create something that, that sort of shows that the team is able to make progress, um, gives the team confidence, gives the product owner confidence, and shows that things are moving in the right direction, even in the first sprint. If the team can't do that, then really the team isn't in a position to um, start the first proper sprint, the team then needs to do some upfront, upfront investigation or exploration work, which is in a way sort of a little bit similar to what you have in, in XP and extreme programming, where you have an exploration phase where mm. you do some pre-work. Um, so, so sometimes that's also the case that simply the team needs to do a couple of sprints of pre-work, but I wouldn't then say that those are proper sprints um, because the team wouldn't be uh, in a position to create potentially shippable product increments. Okay. And how you approach how you approach it, how you play it, is really up to the product owner and the team. It comes down to what we call release planning in Scrum. Um, and release planning consists of um, two parts. One is estimating and the other one is, is planning. So once the product backlog has been stocked, once an initial product backlog has been created, and the team and the product owner would get together and the team would estimate each line item in the product backlog. Um, and that would also give the product owner um, a very rough idea um, in, in terms of sort of, you know, associated effort um, that is required in order to deliver a specific product backlog item. Right. And the second thing is the team would uh, then um, estimate or hopefully maybe even know at this, you know, depending on when you perform the sprint planning, uh, the team would sort of um, work out its velocity and then say, you know, um, given that we employ, for instance, two week sprints and we have the following velocity and this is the amount of efforts, say story points in the product backlog, this is how long it's going to take us. So what we typically recommend in Scrum is that early on in the Scrum project, a release plan, a project plan is created that states um, the likely order of um, delivery of specific requirements of the requirements holding the product backlog simply to align the expectations of the product owner and the other stakeholders. I mean, as a product owner, I need to know um, when all the, 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 the must have, um, the, man, the mandatory, the high, the high priority requirements of my software system can be shipped. So, you know, I can make meaningful decisions in, in terms of, you know, time, um, feature set and, and, and cost budget. Okay. So um, let's say we, we finished our sprint and now we have to do the sprint review meeting you already, already mentioned. The sprint review meeting in Scrum. Well, like any meeting in Scrum, the sprint review meeting is time boxed and the length depends on the, on the, on the sprint length. Um, the longer the sprint, the more time you have to spend in the review meeting. Now, the review meeting is really an opportunity for the product owner to understand the project progress, um, get together with the team, um, and uh, have a look at inspect um, the software created by the team. It's an opportunity for the team to take pride in what the team's achieved and accomplished and demo it to the product owner and get feedback from the product owner. So at the end, um, as part of the review meeting, we really want to understand what the real project progress is. Mm. And um, 
the approach or the agenda of um, the review meeting is fairly simple. Um, the team goes through the list of committed requirements and demos the requirements to the product owner. Um, that should be um, a live demo, and that means um, an official build is um, is deployed on a target machine and tests are executed in real time in front of the product owner. And the product owner should also have the opportunity to execute tests or play around with the software to understand if the requirements um, were adequately implemented or not. Mm -hmm. And the product owner um, may also want to look through other artifacts such as documentation, um, any 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 artifacts that are due to the, the work agreements between the product owner and the team uh, that need to be created, things like um, Java doc, for instance, or UML mm -hmm. documentation or end user documentation, um, just sort of to make sure that the documentation is there and that he's happy with the quality. Um, because ultimately the product owner is responsible for the return of investment, is responsible for making sure that um, money is spent wisely and the product uh, outcome or the project outcome is um, does satisfy the end user needs. So um, that's why we have the, the demo meeting, the review meeting, so the product owner can, can give feedback um, with regards to the work results delivered and can understand the, the progress made. So the important thing about understanding the project progress in the sprint review meeting is that the product owner should only accept work results that are done and work results are done in scrum when the conditions of satisfaction for each requirement is adequately implemented by the team that's why it's so important to carry out tests as part of the review meeting and have a live demo okay so um does scrum say I mean, um, is this just a demo after a sprint or are these really releases where the customer gets its software or even uh, it's getting sold or whatever? Uh, are these releases or are these just demo points? Yeah, good question. Um, well, as we discussed um, a few times, Scrum requires that the outcome of each sprint um must create some business value and must be a potentially shippable product increment. So whatever comes out of a sprint should be able to be shipped to an end customer or end user. It's up to the product owner to decide if the product owner wants to actually release it and put it into production. So say, for instance, you have a Scrum project that lasts six months. The product owner could decide that he'll release after three months. Mm -hmm. And then again, um, release after six months at the end of the project, or the product owner could decide that he releases um, software at the end of each sprint. It's entirely up to the product owner, and product owner and team should agree prior to, um, or at the early, at the beginning of the project, um, how long it will take the team to transform a potentially shippable product in increment into a truly shippable product increment. Um, Say, for instance, you provide an IT solution, then, then often um, the organization's um, procedures around putting something into production determine how long, um, it, how quickly you can actually ship something. You know, you may have to go to some sort of steering board meeting or review meeting mm. to be allowed to put something into production, or the organization may say, well, we can, we only put um, new software systems into production once a month or something. So, you know, there may be external constraints that, that may determine how, how often a team can then actually put something in production and ship it. Okay. Uh, the other meet or the other review meeting, big review meeting is the retrospective me meeting after, um, yeah, after the project, as I understood you. Um, how is this uh, conducted? What's happening in there? Yeah, the retrospective is another very important and mandatory meeting in Scrum. Actually, it's part of every sprint, so it's not only okay. performed at the end um, of the project, but uh, actually at the end of each sprint. It's an opportunity for the team to reflect on how the team's been, how the team uh, has been working so far, and, and you know how well the team managed to collaborate in uh, in in the last sprint. So it's all about saying you know, what went well and particularly what didn't go so well um, to identify the key issues the team is facing and um, focus on the key issue, perform a root cause analysis and come up with actionable um, improvement measures that, that can be then put forward to the next sprint planning meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the retrospective really is there to help the team um, you could say improve the process, improve the way the team collaborates, works together and make make work ultimately more fun. Okay. 
the, the important thing maybe about the retrospective to, to be in mind is um, that in, in order to um, make an retrospective work and have an effective retrospective, um, it is important to facilitate it well. It is important to prepare it well, um, ha you know, have the right setting and set the stage properly, um, do some timekeeping, have a structure, think about um, techniques and tools um, as a facilitator you can suggest to the team um, to um, um, extract issues and problems, uh, for instance, you know, to use index cards as a, as a structured brainstorming technique. So those are things that are important to, to be in mind. And typically, you know, it, it is typically, it is probably a good idea for the Scrum Master to facilitate the first few retrospectives to sort of lead the team through the process. Um, and also to ensure that there's no blaming. Um, you know, any issues that come up should be part of, um, you know, you could say, the general work habits and how things are done in the organization rather than an individual's fault. Mm -hmm. That's something as a facilitator and scrum master, you want to watch out for that, you know, the, 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 the retrospective doesn't turn into a blaming game. Um, and, and I think it's also important to focus um, the team on what the team can actually do to improve its way of working. Sometimes the team is heavily constrained by external factors um, and, and needs some, some management support, some, some support by the um, um, organization. And that's good to note and notice, but you know sometimes it can be a danger of um, finger pointing too much at people outside of the team rather than sort of sitting down and, and reflecting on how as a team, how can we improve um, the way we work together, the way we collaborate, the, the way we make decisions, for instance, the way we deal with uh, issues and conflicts. Um, you know, how, how well did the daily scrum work? Um, how come that, you know, we had difficulties um, time boxing it? How come that, you know, people didn't arrive on time? Um, how come that the last planning meeting was a pain and uh, was very difficult? Yeah. Those are sort of things you want to you want to discuss in the retrospective. Okay, I guess we are through with the overview of Scrum and could answer or, or I could give a few frequently asked questions to you uh, regarding Scrum. Um, but before this, uh, are we have we everything um, covered? You you want to talk about in the overview? Yeah, I think we've covered sort of the core of, of Scrum, um, at least briefly, um, it, it may be worth talking about issues that, that are likely or frequently issues that frequently mm. arise when you, when you first, uh, when you start your first Scrum project, but maybe that's, that's part of your frequently asked questions. Yeah. Why don't we, why, why don't we see what the questions are and then we take things from there? Okay. Um, one thing, um, that comes to mind for me, always, if I talk about Scrum, a lot of people think Scrum is a software development methodology as XP is. To me personally, I don't think it's a um, software development methodology. It's more a project management framework or however I should call it. Now, there aren't a lot of parts of how do I do coding? How do I write requirements down there? Um, do you have the same uh, view on this or uh, am I getting things wrong there? Yeah, I'd say Scrum is an, an agile framework for developing software systems. Um, it, it was certainly designed with the intention in mind uh, to use to use it as a framework for software development. You're absolutely right. It does not contain any specific recommendations um, for development practices. It is really focused on management, project management um, practices and requirements management practices. Mm -hmm. um, however, Scrum does stipulate that each um, that the outcome of each sprint must be potentially shippable. And if um, a team um, wants to create potentially shippable product increments in a reliable way, then the team does have to reflect on how it actually creates the software, how it tests the software. And um, most Scrum teams I've worked with ended up um, embracing Scrum, um, sorry, embracing extreme programming development practices such mm. as test first and refactoring and continuous integration. So you can think of Scrum like, like um, you know, a wrapper or a framework where you can drop in specific practices you need, um, such as ex extreme programming development practices. Mm. Uh, that would actually be my next question. Um, what's the relationship between um, ex extreme programming and special and the agile movement uh, in general and Scrum, as I think they, they uh, fit well together, at least extreme programming and Scrum, as you said? Yeah, I think so. I think X XP and, and Scrum go together real nice and I've worked with um, a few, quite a few teams that um, embraced, you know, Scrum and incorporated um, 
extreme programming development practices. There's there's also a fair overlap when it comes down to um, project management and requirements management practices. I think Scrum and XP um, are really sort of um, are growing together in a way, and you can see that from the fact that in Scrum now we we teach um, you know um, user stories, or you know we have a certain you know, many many Scrum teams um, have started to, to to employ user stories as a requirements description technique. Mm -hmm. We've started to teach um, velocity and story points as um, estimation and, and tracking techniques, um, which originate from extreme programming. So I think the two things are growing together, and they they fit fit very nicely. Um, that's 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 my experience. Okay, so same here. Um, one question I often get asked is um, who uses um, blah, 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 extreme programming, Scrum, whatever, um, because mo a lot of people think they are pretty new and Scrum isn't that new. Nevertheless, uh, are there any references you can give us? Yeah, I think the list of uh, Scrum of companies that employ Scrum is, is, is growing and growing. Um, m maybe just a few. Yahoo um, uses Scrum, Microsoft, SAP, British Telecom, BBC, um, Nokia, Motorola, Siemens, and, and many others. Mm. Um, particularly in the last few years, we've seen um, some some major companies um, embrace Scrum and certainly experiment with Scrum and um, execute individual Scrum projects. And I think it's simply down to the fact that um, even larger um, organizations now understand that Scrum can give them a significant significant competitive advantage in terms of you know shortening time to market, increasing product quality, being more flexible, uh, increasing productivity, and um, you know companies are, are looking into reaping those those benefits. Scrum seems to have a certain appeal to to larger companies, at least in my opinion. I mean, um, there are not so many huge companies using extreme programming or lean software development, the feature-driven de development. Um, but Scrum has a very impressive user list on the larger company side. Do you have any idea why this is? I don't know why, to be honest. <laughs> okay. um, Maybe, maybe simply because Scrum is called Scrum and not extreme programming or extreme something. Um, I, I'm not sure really. I mean, maybe, maybe to a certain extent, maybe, maybe part of the explanation or put, 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 maybe a potential explanation could be that Scrum is more focused on management practices and mm -hmm. that, that makes it, you know, uh, in quotation marks, an, an easier sell to, uh, you know, C level management like yeah. a CEO or a CIO, CTO. Okay. I'm not, not so sure. Um, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see um, how how that trend develops and how many um, large organizations really embrace, fully embrace Scrum over an extended period of time. Mm. So how should I start if I want to use Scrum? The, the most important question, I guess, here. How should you start? Uh, how should you start to use Scrum? Well, I guess I guess part of setting yourself up for success is um, finding um, a, a good pilot project. And I'd say it, it's probably a good idea to find um, a Scrum pilot, um, a project to try out and experiment with Scrum that um, does have some business relevance. So does something that's meaningful to the business and where the business has has a real interest in or the end users have a real interest in, but, but at the same time is, is not mission critical. Mm. So, you know, a project where you actually have the opportunity to make a mistake and recover from a mistake. Because like anything new that you try out the first time, um, there is a learning curve you'll have to go through. And as human beings, we typically only learn by making mistakes. So, um, you know, a certain mistake tolerance within the project is probably a good idea. So that's that's my first piece of advice I have. In, in, in terms of how you approach it, well, the traditional way, way to um, get Scrum going in an organization is simply to do it, try it out, uh, find a product owner, um, find somebody from, from the business or the end user community that's willing to act as a product owner, pull together a cross-functional team that has the right people, the right performers in it, and is as autonomous as possible and, you know, get going, you know, start with the first pull together an initial um, product backlog um, and then start with the first sprint and um, take things from there, really. Um, so that's that's the traditional way to to experiment Scrum and, and get Scrum going in an organisation. Um, in the last few years, um, 
an, an, an alternative approach has become popular, and that is really, you know, to make Scrum a, a strategic initiative. Um, so you have somebody like um, the C CIO say, you know, within IT, you know, from now on, I want to establish Scrum. Um, and so you have um, executive management level support and you get in consultants, you hire consultants to come in and help to train people and help to run Scrum projects. Um, and, and that would be then um, a top down rather than a bottom up approach. Okay. However you approach it, um, I, I would really recommend that you first run a series of Scrum pilots, pilot projects where you, mm. um, where you experiment with Scrum, where you find the best way to 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 um, leverage scrum but also employ scrum properly within the organization before you attempt any form of rollout and you know organization wide um, rollout of scrum mm -hmm. so basically a piecemeal growth approach is is i think what works best for organizations and you know not to discourage you but but just as a as a as a, as a as a piece of advice, I guess um, Scrum does introduce deep change into organizations and it does challenge conventional ways of thinking and, and acting. So it does challenge conventional work habits. So, you know, um, introducing Scrum, uh, particularly in large organizations and organizations um, whose company culture is not in line, not very much in line with, with the agile values means that there will be a certain amount of impediments um, um, that surface, there, will, there may also be a certain amount of friction um, that is likely to happen. And, um, you, you know, it's probably just a good idea to be aware of it and, and you know, to be prepared to a certain extent. Mm. But you'll never find out these things until you try. So the best thing you can do is, is really try it, you know, see how it works for you, see what uh, issues you run into, see what benefits you can, um, uh, you can reap and take things from there. Okay. So uh, last question for me. Um, a question I always ask at this point, when shouldn't I do Scrum? Are there any things I, you, you mentioned already with the, the culture of the company doesn't fit, um, very well to, to the culture of Scrum. Anything else you, you, comes to mind there? Well, I'd say there are really two situations I can think of when you shouldn't do Scrum. Um, one is, um, when the company is doing really well. So, you know, your value creation is great. Your profits, um, uh, are developing really nicely. Your employees are very happy, and your your customers are highly satisfied. I mean, if you're in that situation, why should you change? Mm -hmm. Why should you introduce Scrum? I mean, you must be doing something that is very similar to to Agile or Lean or Scrum in one way or the other. So you know, I mean, that's that's perfect. That's brilliant. Congratulations. Um, but the second scenario I can think of when I wouldn't recommend that you um, uh, try to introduce Scrum is when you know from your own recent and personal experience that management is not willing to, to change or embrace change, that management is not willing to um, empower teams and allow teams delegate some level of decision making to the teams. Um, and that management um, holds on to, to dysfunctional command and control habits. Um, if, if, if that's the case, then I'd recommend that you resign immediately and look for a new employer that truly respects its employees. I mean, you know, a situation like this, you know, I, f I find it in a situation like this, I find it really difficult to imagine how you can successfully establish Scrum. I mean, Scrum is, is likely to bring about some form of, of, of um, deep change, uh, possibly some form of, of, of culture change in your organization. And how easy that is for, for your organization and for your teams, you, you, you'll never f find out until you try. Mm. Okay. Um, anything else you want to, to add on, on the topic? I think Scrum is fun. Um, I think most, most teams that um, employ Scrum enjoy it very much, uh, enjoy very much um, the, the, the way of, of working together, the close collaboration. There's some people that struggle with it, but generally speaking, most of the teams I've worked with have, have really strived, have really excelled using Scrum. And um, most of the product owners I've met have been very pleased, have been delighted with the results um, that the teams could, um, could accomplish. So I think it's definitely worth um, trying out Scrum, giving it a go. Um, if you need any form of support, the Scrum Alliance website um, is probably a good place to um, to look for um, further information, support, um, training. If if you want to, um, if you feel you have any training needs, um, so that's probably a good good place to go and visit. Okay, uh, thanks for your time and it was a great interview. Thank you very much. My pleasure.
Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.